Indianapolis Colts. Oh, that's yes. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. yeah. They play well, some football out there in Indianapolis, right? <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, good morning. We just jumped on live just to say hello to everyone. I was wondering, I know I try to type this stuff in, but um, maybe I'm saying this wrong, Joe. Is it sports team, right? It's like any sports is fine. What's your mm -hmm. favorite sports team, guys? So Joshua is saying Detroit Pistons. And I think earlier, let's see, Vance was saying University of Notre Dame and the Chicago White Sox, of course. <laughs> So we'd love to hear from you guys. If you're sports fans, uh, what is your favorite team? If you're not a sports fan, man, just go ahead, type in your favorite typeface. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I, whenever I do these things, I kind of start off by saying, is there any sports fans in the room? And, you know, inevitably designers and sports don't always necessarily mix. So there's usually like two or three people. And I always say, this is going to be great for you three people. The rest of you just <laughs> bear with us, you know? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, now we've got some teams coming on in. Here we go. Eagles, Cubs, awesome. Baltimore Orioles, Seahawks. Oh, I love Seahawks. Milwaukee Brewers. Here we go. And pro. All right, guys. You guys have any collegiate teams? Not that you have to, but Radford Highlanders. Mm -hmm. Who is Radford? Do you know them? That's that's Corey Durand, who's one of our clients from Radford. So welcome, oh, Corey. Awesome. Um, hang in there. Hang in there. You're going to get a little shout out in this, uh, <laughs> this presentation. So. Oh, sweet. Sports fan in general from Troy. Thanks. The Horn Frogs from David and Nebraska Corn Huskers. All right. Yeah, awesome. Lots, well, thank you everyone for joining fans. us. Cool. Yeah, lots of college fans. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us. And mm -hmm. uh, we're just going to get started. Apologies. I have a little bit of sound coming from outside, so hopefully it won't bother anyone, but we are going to get started. So. If you'll do me a favor and uh, copy the URL, share it out to your friends and your followers and your family. Who knows, you know, if you have sports fans in the in the family, maybe they would love to watch this. But I'm here with Joe Wasak, and he is from Pottsville. Is that correct? Yeah, of all yeah. places, right? <laughs> yeah, Pottsville, Pennsylvania, which is uh, my hometown. Although I didn't start the business here in Pottsville. I actually started in New York City. I spent the early years of my career in, in New York in it's a pretty portable business. So when I moved, it, it, it came with me, but, um, but yeah, it's a, this is a small little, you know, coal mining town in Southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, famous for beer actually. So we have a brewery here that is, uh, um, I guess right now, one of the largest domestic brewers in the country. So six blocks South of here, they make some beer. So that's what we do. Wow. Who knew? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So where, where are you right now? I see a ton of basketballs right behind you. Yeah. Yeah, this is my studio space, um, which is uh, littered with uh, sports apparel, sports goods, and those basketballs on the back wall are some of the work that we've done at the at the NCAA for in and around the, the Final Four. So it's it's football helmets, Rachel. It's basketballs. It's footballs. It's jerseys. It's everything. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah, would love to. Would love to take a tour. But uh, oh let's yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So what we'll do is we'll jump in if that's okay. Mm -hmm. We'll get started yeah, sure. for everyone. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know. Totally jealous, right, Tracy? I know how exciting. Mm -hmm. So, um, Joe, if you'll share your screen, then we'll get started. I'll turn off my mic so the so the noise is not so much. Okay. Let me see if this. Hopefully, this will work. Yeah. Now, guys, really quick before okay. Joe gets started, if you have any questions, put them underneath in the Ask a Question tab. We will address them afterwards. If you have some comments, feel free to throw them in the chat. All right, Joe, we see Excellent. you, so go ahead. Well, great. Well, I'm, you know, I've, um, I'm a, a designer that works uh, almost exclusively. Almost everything that I do is inside the sports world in one form or another. Some of that is professional sports. A lot of it is collegiate sports. Um, a lot of it is event identity. You can think of sports identities and events and how those are, are important. And what I, I see myself really as, I don't know if it's a growing trend, but I, I definitely see it as a trend in the design world where I am highly specialized in a very narrow discipline. Um, I'm highly specialized in identity design and my narrow discipline is really inside of sports. And this is really one of the things that I think is great about a career in design is that you can find these niches and you can combine a certain aspect of 
design with something that you're really passionate about. So, you know, if you're really into um, web design and you're really into high fashion, for example, there's somebody out there that's buying that kind of design right now. So you can really make a go at it and have a career in some of the things that really excite you and really influence you. For me, um, if I was here on a map, I'd be somewhere at, right at the corner of creativity and sports. And I love this business. It is full of perhaps some of the most loyal brand consumers on the planet. Um, sports fans loyalty goes far beyond a rational preference. It's really tribal. It's really a us versus them kind of scenario, the good guys versus the bad guys. And if you take a look at this slide, just these fans from Philadelphia, uh, the Philadelphia Union was a project we worked on a number of years ago, but th these guys could be a church. If they weren't wearing all of their union gear and they weren't waving those flags, uh, you sort of get that kind of um, uh, way people sort of view their, uh, their, their sports teams. And when you factor in the power of alma mater, it gets even more amplified at the collegiate level. So, uh, for example, these rabid Duke fans that you're, you're seeing now. Not only is, is Duke their team, it's a part of who they are. Um, they, they may not be basketball players. They may not be um, athletes at all, but they're all Blue Devils at Duke. So it really does um, become pervasive in the collegiate space. And this kind of brand, uh, this sort of irrational brand loyalty doesn't exist in other places in the consumer product world. Uh, if you walk down the street with a Coca-Cola t-shirt on and you came across somebody with a Pepsi t-shirt on, it, you're probably, it's probably not going to turn to blows, right? You know, if you, if you walked into a Walmart with a Target t-shirt on, you probably wouldn't get booed out of the place. But these are common occurrences in stadiums and arenas all across the country. Fans have this kind of uh, a brand loyalty to their to their specific teams, and you know a lot of times it's not that we're we pick it; we're born with it, right? I mean, our our brand loyalty is is inherited in a lot of ways, and um, that kind of passion is sort of passed down from generation to uh, to generation, um, and and and. Uh, our allegiances are a lot like family in a lot of ways. Um, we, we talk about our teams as us and uh, uh, we talk about them as we, um, you know, we're, we're going to win tonight or there's no way the 49ers are going to beat us on Sunday, that kind of language. And fans are so loyal that even when they're playing bad, they still show up like these Knicks fans here. The common protest among sports fans is to wear a bag over your head. We're going to show up. We're going to support you. We love you, but we don't want to be seen um, showing showing up showing up at a game. And you know, the season the Knicks had this year, I don't, I really don't blame these guys. You know, um, a lot of times you'll see you know fans get really super passionate about things, and they'll actually get tattoos of logos on uh, on their bodies. You know, this is uh, one of our logos, Boise State. If I known that this was going to end up this big on this guy's shoulder, I probably would have taken a little bit more care with that type, maybe. Maybe the, maybe the tattoo artist probably should have taken a little more care with that type. But fans uh, in sports are more than just, you know, rabid lunatics that paint their faces on game day, um, people that just get really, really excited about their teams. They are really um, stakeholders in the work that we do and very important stakeholders in the work that we do. Um, they really are the, the ultimate consumers of what we do. And, and it, it becomes a challenge in some times because the you know, fans inherently are, um, are adverse to change. Uh, but it wasn't always like that. You know, I think that, that, that fans were, fans have always been passionate about their teams, but the business of sports has changed dramatically over the years. This is the 1934 Harvard football team. And the, 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 the aesthetics of sports was very, very different back then. Um, the, the, it wasn't really important about what our teams looked like. Fans really engaged with their teams on the radio. They didn't really see what they looked like. So the aesthetics were very different. And I think this really does illustrate the point. This is one football team 
and they're, they're wearing different jerseys. You know, some players have numbers on their jerseys. Some have stripes. This guy there in the back row has got this jersey with just an H on it. Um, what they looked like on the field wasn't really, um, wasn't really important. And then in, I guess it was 19, I think it was like 1946, the American Needle Corporation uh, convinced Philip Wrigley, the owner of the Chicago Cubs, to allow them to sell uh, replica baseball caps in, in the stadium. And I know that, and it was famously quoted by the Cubs as saying, who, who would ever want to buy the caps that the players are wearing on the football, on the, on the baseball field? And I think we all know how, how that, that turned out. And now, and that was really sort of the birth of modern day licensing in sports. And modern day licensing in sports has really become a huge revenue stream for the teams that we support and the teams that we love. Uh, pr prior to this, teams and leagues were in the business of putting on games. They were concerned about getting fans in seats. They weren't really thinking about other ways to be able to leverage their brand. In fact, you really didn't have a brand beyond uh, what that in the stadium experience was. And ever since, you know, the American Eagle started making caps for the Cubs, licensing has become pervasive. So you have, it's really touches every aspect of our lives, like this Arizona Cardinals number one fan license plate. People put this on their cars. Um, I think they probably made more than one of these. So it's unlikely that we'll ever know who the actual number one fan is of the Arizona Cardinals, but they're, they're sort of pervasive. It, it touches the lives of our children, right? I mean, this baby bib, this little Eagles fans. This is, we talked about inheriting our allegiances. This is really kind of how it starts. Um, things like this luggage. Um, you know, you wouldn't, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that we put sports logos on these things, but this is how they touch our lives in, uh, in just about every single way. Um, even our pets, this Indiana Hoosiers dog collar for your dog. I mean, how do we know the dog's a Hoosiers fan, right? Maybe he's a, maybe he's a Michigan fan. I, I don't know. But anyway, we've got it. Um, the things also, I mean, we talk about sort of licensing in children's products. This is actually, I, I think this is actually pretty cool. I'd buy this. This is a Lego set, the University of North Carolina, their mascot, which is a Ram, um, but, but also a licensed product in sports. Um, e even our coffee cups are demuned. This is a coffee cup koozie from oh, one of our clients from Michigan State. I guess it, I guess it serves a function, right? Probably keeps your, keeps your coffee warm. And then, of course, if, if Philip Wrigley could see us now, Chicago Cubs fidget spinners. You know, fidget spinners, I guess they were hot for what? I don't know, like a couple of months uh, last year where every kid had one of these things. Uh, sports teams jumped on that bandwagon and you have licensed product like this. These are trends that exist within licensing. And like trends in licensing, athletic identity is really affected by trends as well. So in the 60s and in the 70s, sports teams really bore these friendly mascot-based logos like this Milwaukee Bucks. It was really influenced by the trend of the time. Uh, things were really more, um, just not, not quite as, um, as loud or, or overstated. Here's another one. This is the Cleveland Browns brownie. I'm not even sure what a brownie is. If anybody knows, um, they could probably uh, tell us what a, what a brownie is. I think it's kind of an elf. Uh, but this is a logo that was done in the 60s. Uh, you could see how some of the line weight is really thin. They weren't thinking about modern day licensing programs and, and capitalizing on these things. These were just icons for the teams that they represent. Uh, here's another one, uh, Penn State here in my neck of the woods. So you can see how this one, once again, I mean, created for different reasons than sports logos are created uh, created today. Um, and then when I entered the scene in the sports world, in the sports design world, really, the trend was to more aggressive, animated um, type logos like this. This is Cal State Northridge, just to your north, uh, Rachel, there in the valley. Um, and, you know, really sort of, th this is a everything for everybody kind of logo. And that was the style at the time. That's what we were all doing this New Jersey Rutgers Scarlet Knights, this tells the entire story. There's no aspiration in a mark like this. It has, uh, it, again, trying to be everything to uh, everything to everybody. It's really not up for interpretation, right? It's sort of right there, right at you. Uh, 
And then, of course, who can forget the New York Islanders in the mid-90s? They made a change to this logo. Again, very much a more is more kind of logo. Very loud, very bold. Everything was very big. And that was really affected by the trend of the times, right? In the 90s, it was big pants. It was big, loud colors. It was big jackets. It was Zubaz pants and Gucci sweaters and those kinds of things. And the fashion really did um, affect what, uh, what the sports logos looked like of the time. And now today, we're really kind of in uh, fast forward in reverse. And we're really going back to, well, fashion at least, is really going back to um, vintage kind of looks, uh, looks that, have been, that are inspired by um, fashions of the past and those kinds of things. You, you don't have to go further than your closest Abercrombie and Fitch to see that. Um, all of the clothes are kind of that vintage inspired, more form fitting, um, a little bit more slender. And that, that has really um, affected the way that sports logos are created today. Um, in the last handful of years, in the NBA alone, this is just one league, there's been five teams that have reverted to vintage or classic looks from their past. The 76ers, the Utah Jazz, the Golden State Warriors, the Atlanta Hawks, and the Detroit Pistons. So you're really starting to see how that trend of vintage and more classic looks is really starting to affect the world of sports. I mean, or has been, really has been affecting the world of sports. Joe, do you see that yeah. on a regular basis where fashion is influencing the, the logos, the identities? No doubt, no doubt. And I think it's, I think it's not, only, not only is it fashion, it's also trends. Um, sports logos are not unlike any other um, type of branding in that regard. Now you think about you know trademarks and logos of the '60s and the '70s. They were very, very clean and and um, and sort of less was more. And now you think about trademarks now. I mean, there's there's um, you know things like the AT and T logo where there's more gradients and more technology sort of looks into those. Um, th th that's because you know the fashion sort of really does kind of dictate uh, dictate some of that. I think it's also application too. We'll talk a little bit more. Um, about that too. Okay. And, you know, even like teams that don't have a vintage look to sort of rely on, they're inventing vintage looks. So here is the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, they had a very much 90s type logo, this very animated, what was called the Devil Ray type of fish. And they've gone to this very simple and clean TB logo. Um, the Miami Marlins, another example. The Marlins had a very animated, very detailed 90s-like logo when they were initially in, at their conception, uh, when that team sort of came to be, or an expansion team. And now they have this real 80s kind of inspired vintage logo. This is not from their past, but it's a logo that was invented so that it feels like it's from the past. So what does any of this sort of have to do with typography, right? I mean... The, I, I know, Rachel, I know you were thinking that. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, let's get to the type, um, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it has, the typography in sports design is, um, is pervasive. You, you really think about some of the most iconic sports logos in the history of sports. The New York Yankees, for example, or the Notre Dame Fighting Irish in the collegiate space. The Green Bay Packers and the Montreal Canadiens, these are just four examples here. These are all type-driven logos. They're little more than letters that are composed in a way that make them unique and ownable to the teams that they represent. Um, and that is something that in my career, I sort of recognized pretty early. Uh, I started out in the creative services department at the National Hockey League, and one of the projects that I was very lucky to work on very early in my career was when the Quebec Nordiques relocated from Quebec City to Denver, Colorado, and became the Colorado Avalanche. So this was a project that I worked on along with a lot of other very talented designers. But this logo is little more than just an A. Um, there is, uh, there's some animation to it. There's some movement in as this puck sort of slides down. But this is really based off of letter forms. And it's something that 
I continue to do in my work today. So this is Mississippi State, a project that we did probably 10 years ago. Um, and this logo, just an M and the word state across it in a banner, done in a way and composed in a way that makes it unique and ownable to Mississippi State. So it's not just a letter by itself. It's a letter with a little bit of ownability to it. And um, here's another project that we worked on probably right around the same time, a little bit later. This is Bradley University. Again, it's just this bold letter B. And I use typography in my work to tell a story, to contribute to a narrative, to um, uh, support a narrative. So at Bradley University, was something really interesting was happening. They had at one end of campus this uh, Bradley Hall, which was this real gothic looking uh, inspired building, the original building that was there on campus. And then they had all of these other buildings that were surrounding it that were built in the 60s or the 70s or the 50s. And they were very much this brutalist like architecture, big concrete structures. And they were taking some of these buildings and they were reskinning them in to, to feel like this Gothic architecture, um, adding granite skin to these things and creating um, different, uh, different elements. They built a new building on campus that has gargoyles on it, a brand new building with gargoyles. When was the last time you saw anybody putting sandstone gargoyles on a, on a building? So uh, there, was really this, there was really this kind of um, renaissance that was happening on campus. So the typography that we developed for them is really much like that, where it has this sort of evocative feel of this Gothic architecture. Uh, the letter form itself, this almost like chiseled kind of a feel to it, something you could very easily see cast in one of these buildings. Um, this is uh, Whitman College, a project that we just did last year. Whitman is in Walla Walla, Washington. They are at the base of the Blue Mountains. It's just a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And this logo also contributes to that narrative. Uh, the name of the team is actually the Blues, named after the Blue Mountains. And you can see here the top of this logo, these sort of up and down of the mountains, really coming out of the letter forms. So using that typography, using a ligature like this to be able to tell part of that story, um, it's not like those logos in the 90s where we're trying to be everything to everyone, where we're trying to tell the entire story in a complete image. This allows for some interpretation by the viewer, but it's inspired by and starts to contribute to that narrative of the mountains. This is the Greensboro Sports Foundation. It's not just all team logos for us. There's all sorts of uh, logos that are um, associated with or also exist in the sports industry. But this is a foundation logo. Foundations feel um, prestigious. There's a, there's a, a certain quality to them. This crest-like G, uh, that where the G starts to contribute again to the narrative of the, of the overall foundation. Um, here's another example. This is a logo that we did for IMG Sports. Um, IMG represents Monica Puig. Uh, Monica Puig is a Puerto Rican tennis star. She won the gold medal last uh, in the last Olympics in Rio. And her game is just smooth and fluid and powerful. So really using this letter form, this P, to show a, a muscular component to it, to show a very athletic component to it, but to also contribute to the narrative of who she is, that, uh, that sleek and fluid motions that, um, that are, are exhibited in, in her game. Um, and it's not all just kind of straight up type either. You know, sometimes we get to have some fun. So this is the University of Central Washington. Central, often referred to as Central, here's an opportunity for us to bring in some direct components of their nickname, they're the Wildcats, into this C logo and have it just be a little bit more animated and a little bit more, a little bit more fun. Um, one more here to share with you guys and then we'll talk a little bit, we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit, but this is, uh, this is the Radford logo. So Corey Durant from Radford, we saw you, we saw you in the room. Um, this is, uh, the, Radford is the Highlanders. 
uh, the campus is sort of on this hill and the, and the, the, the hills of the Highlanders uh, sort of come into play. But you can see how there's this, this Scottish influence of the tartan that's here in the background. This black letter type look in their R, distinctive and ownable, but also contributing to the narrative of who they are, really starts to tell the story of, of who they are. And one of the things that I often will hear about you know, sports logos in general is that, Corey, Corey well, they, they, it is a sharp looking logo, Corey, thanks. <laughs> but, um, but one of the things that we often hear about sports logos is that they're, they're heavy handed. They have this, this all, always stroked in this bold outline. And why can't they be a little bit more, um, you know, so, some, so, to somewhat uh, designed or perhaps softer in that regard. And that's really by design. I mean, we think about, we talked a little bit about licensing earlier. And when we develop identity, uh, once it leaves our hands, it goes to our clients. And from them, it goes to hundreds, perhaps even thousands of licensees that are going to apply it to all of those things, all of those baby bibs and dog collars and all those other things that show up in the bookstore. So they have to be really, really simple to use. So one of the techniques that we've employed over the years is to be able to encase some of these logos in a shape. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to take it from a light background to a red background to a blue background uh, without um, any need for, for color rotation. They essentially become, uh, for lack of a better term, bulletproof. So it's very, very hard for licensees to use them, um, use them incorrectly. Uh, one more, uh, one more letter logo here. This is Susquehanna University. Susquehanna is tucked onto the banks of the Susquehanna River um, here in Pennsylvania, and the river has really seen a resurgence of um, of wildlife in the last handful of years. For many, many years, it was extremely polluted. It was an environmental disaster. But they've cleaned up the river and they're starting to see a resurgence in the osprey population and the eagle population in and around that part of the world. So Susquehanna was going through a name change. They settled on the nickname River Hawks to pay tribute to that. And again, this is a simple letter form logo that really does uh, uh, leans towards that nickname and really does start to help tell some of the story of the, uh, of the Susquehanna River Hawk. Uh, but more importantly, perhaps on this slide, is it's really basic and simple colors. And it's something that we hear all the time, I mean, in the work that we do. Why can't we have um, more unique colors, things that are more ownable, something that might be a little bit totally, totally unexpected? And it really does come down to how the application drives some of the design decisions that we can make as sports designers. Fabrics at all of the suppliers, the Nikes and the Adidas's and the Under Armors of the world, fabrics are not in um, unlimited supply. There are sort of narrow choices that we, we can make. And most important application of color is always going to be in uniform. So this is just a screen grab of the Nike Team Builder, just using them as one example. Um, Nike Team Builder is something that a lot of coaches will use to sort of uh, create uniforms and build what their team is going to look like. Coaches still have a lot of say in what their players look like. And you can see here, there's not, again, there's not an endless supply of brown color. So there's only so many things that we can do. So the color choices that we make as designers, again, are, are really affected by the, um, by the end application, by the, the application really does drive what we can and can't do. And even the, a lot of the icons that we create, a lot of the primary logos letter driven, those are, um, those are important pieces of any athletic identity. But perhaps even more important and perhaps um, a, a little less revered are word marks. And again, these are just expressions of typography that are used in, in athletics in really important and meaningful ways. Think about at the collegiate level, every uniform that every athlete is going to wear is going to say where they're from. You know, it's going to have uh, an indication of, of, of where, of the school or the team or whoever they represent right across the chest. So, and this is in a lot of ways, the most authentic application of sports identity. It's on the backs of those athletes that, uh, of that particular team or that particular institution. 
So here's Mississippi State. Um, you can see how they use it consistently across all their sports teams. So that word mark, that expression of typography, shows up on football, it shows up on basketball, cross country, all, all of their teams. So it becomes a real important piece of, um, of, of athletic identity, sports identity. Here's UNLV, uh, that's our custom word mark for Rebels. UNLV is the Rebels across their football jersey. Nice. This is, this is the Wichita State Shockers here on the right side of the screen, one of the greatest nicknames in all of collegiate sports. The shockers, you know, they, they are in, in, uh, in wheat country. So it's a shock of wheat is where their nickname comes from. Uh, this was in the 2000, I think it was 2013, uh, final four. Uh, they wore this Jersey for the first time with this word mark that we created shockers on it. And even though they didn't win, they, they continued to wear it. So, or they did continue to wear it the season after, I think they, I don't know if they still use it, um, to this, to this day. Um, here is, uh, again, how some of the word marks, like some of the, the letter marks that we create, help uh, inform the, help uh, sort of tell that story of the nickname or who they are or where they are. This is the new identity for Cal State Northridge, and it is really inspired by their nickname. They are the Matadors. They were named the Matadors because of their proximity to the San Fernando Mission in the Valley. So this has some Spanish influence and some Spanish flair inside those letters, but still done in a very block kind of athletic way. So again, how typography just sort of helps tell some of that story. This is Point Loma. Point Loma is in San Diego, one of the most beautiful campuses that I think I've ever been on. They have a baseball stadium there. It's called Carol B. Land Stadium. It's nicknamed the most beautiful or the most scenic ballpark in the world. If you uh, if you hit a ball to a to deep left field, it's going to tumble down the cliffs right into the Pacific Ocean. So it's just oh a God. beautiful, just a beautiful place. But this typography, sort of evocative of California, really does have that kind of feel. It it, it feels like it belongs in in that kind of a space. So so sort of being part of that and and helping to tell that story. Uh, this is the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. They are the Seahawks, and this type, evocative of that outstretched wings of the Seahawks in that uh, in that dog bone kind of shape. The C, the 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 terminal of the C, the upper right terminal of the C, evocative of a of a Seahawk talon. So those sorts of things, bringing typography into the narrative. Um, New Orleans, the University of New Orleans, uh, this one contributing to the, the story of where they are. The campus is located right on Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans, and they are the privateers. So they are, here's my dog, uh, they are the privateers. And, uh, you know, this, this, I, this nautical inspired typography that you see here kind of contributing again to that, to that overall story. Um, in the collegiate space, Okay, but you gotta go. <laughs> you gotta go. Um, in the collegiate space, uh, the the typography is we talked about it on uniforms, but in the collegiate space, it's really really important because there are multiple applications of this. In professional sports, you might have one application of a word mark across a jersey that's consistent because they're they're all playing the same sport. In collegiate athletics, you could have upwards of 23 sports where this word mark has to work on different size jerseys, different amounts of real estate, uh, different applications. Sometimes in baseball, we see tackle twill. Sometimes in other jerseys, it's direct print or, uh, or sublimated on the jersey. So thinking about how this ultimate application comes into play. And the other way that typography has really started to affect our work um, is in custom fonts. We're seeing this more and more with our clients because there has been a growing number of communications, specifically in uh, collegiate sports, when it comes to things that are happening like social media. So you know, now we're seeing teams put out a lot more content. Uh, we're seeing our collegiate clients put out a lot more content where they have to they're trying to build a brand through these communications. And one way to do that is to be able to have a custom font that you're using consistently over and over and over again. So these are just a few examples of them. Um, a couple of years ago, we did a custom font for the Tennessee Titans in the NFL. And this is a font, again, that they use consistently through all of their social media 
through all of their advertising. And it really does help them sort of build brand awareness in some of those simple communications that you see in your Twitter feed and they're gone, you know, but having consistent use of typography sort of contributes to that. And I love that uh, alternate A that you have. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's there's actually a bunch of alternate characters in here. There's alternate A's, um, there's alternate M's, alternate N's, uh, alternate W's, um, alternate Y's. You know, I, I, I think a lot of times you see words end in Y, and I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I'm always like, I'm always drawn to that negative space, right? In the lower corner of the Y. So in this instance, when the word ends in Y, you can use a real squared off right side Y to help build sort of um, symmetry to a to a word, so that's just one of my uh, one of my many um, uh, nuances that keep me up at night, Rachel. You know, <laughs> like letters letters and how they how they fit together. You know? Sort of the craft the craft of the whole thing, right? Um, another thing that we're seeing too is is custom numbers, uh, and numbers play an important role in athletics. Every team, just about just about. The golf team doesn't, but we're working on that. Wears a number. They wear numbers on their jerseys. And these are important, um, not, not only important expressions of their brand, but these are important um, communication tools. You think about referees and coaches and statisticians and all those folks that are trying to identify these players on, on the field. And so having this be um, unique and ownable, is just an extension of their brand. So your, your players become as recognizable uh, through time and context, and I believe branding is all about time and context, but they become as recognizable from the backs as they do from the fronts. So numbers being really important. Um, here's the custom number set that we created for Cal State Northridge. So you can see how this one, again, brings in some of that Spanish flair, that Spanish feel um, in some of the serifs and in, in some of this typography. Um, where am I at? Uh, the other thing too, one of, one of the other things that we do uh, quite a bit of is um, is event identity. So uh, event identity really, typography is really important in event identity because it's how this type get how it's how the event gets um, gets expressed in the written form. The, the, everyone is going to have that. Um, in some of the events that we do it becomes an, a real important cohesive glue that holds everything together. This is just a collection of marks that we created for the NCAA. In 2014, 14, 15, we were contracted by the NCAA to help them unify all 90 championships across 24 sports in three divisions. So there's lots of different logos that are out there and one strategy to unify them, to make them all feel like they're coming from the same place is through the use of typography. So this was a custom font that was created specifically for the NCAA. And it allows us to take some of these more well-known championships like the Final Four and the College World Series and connect to some of those lesser known championships in some of the lower divisions. So Division II Baseball and Division II Softball as an example here. And that's something that we carry through to the events themselves. This is just a couple pages of the NCAA style guide for 2016 for the final four. So you can see here how typography holds all of these elements together. There is, uh, there's background pattern, there's texture, there's how the logos get overlapped, how photography is included in all of those, um, in all of those applications that happen in and around the event, the stadium decor, what the court looks like, all of those kinds of things. So the typography really sort of holding all of that, all of that together and being a real important component is one more look at how that, how that happens. You know, one of the things that we do for them is we'll develop, the, the, there are certain uh, trademarks and, and taglines that the NCAA has used over and over again. So using those as expressions of type and having those available to the designers that are actually going to employ those, uh, those logos across all the venue, um, giving them some options and, and things to, to use. Um, so you, one of the things that I think is really different about sports that's different about, you know, corporate branding is the application of the marks really does affect what we can and can't do, the choices that we make as designers. In corporate identity, it's kind of different. You know, the, the identity sort of affects the application and you can do things like this American Airlines logo, which I happen to love. I know a lot, some people don't 
they'll like it. I think it's great. Um, but you can do things like this gradients and these kind of transitions in here because this logo lives in print and in digital. And, and that, that's, uh, that's easy to achieve in, in those mediums. Um, Coca-Cola, for example, the Coca-Cola logo uh, really affecting its application. So, so you can really see how this logo could have inspired some of the curves of that bottle. So that's, uh, it, it, but in sports, it's really, really different. It's the application that really affects the choices that we make and what we can and can't do. Um, embroidery, as an example, are these logos have to be bold, they have to be simple, they have to be clean, because embroidery is a key application of sports logos. So I just have a couple more slides to share, and then we can open it up to questions or, or however whatever whatever we want to do after that i told you i'd be brief rachel so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so but i've been working in sports now for 25 years and um it's it's the greatest industry in the world you know for me i i just i love every moment of it um i love finding new solutions for my clients that really do fit with them that make a lot of sense that that they ultimately end up loving so there's something great about that and there's something really fun about walking into a stadium and you see, you know, 75,000 people wearing, wearing your stuff. It's just a really interesting thing. But for me, the greatest moments are those rare times when you just have brushes with greatness. And in sports, there's, there, there's not a lot of opportunities to do that. There are some, but those are the ones that really get me out of bed in the morning. This is a, a picture of American Pharaoh. American Pharaoh, arguably one of the greatest athletes ever. Uh, he won the American Pharaoh won the Triple Crown in 2016, I think it was 2015, 2016. And that's my logo on his silk there for the Belmont Stakes. So this was the second leg of the, or it was the final leg of the Triple Crown, excuse me. And, uh, and we did the logo for the Belmont Stakes that year. So those brushes of greatness are just the things that I, I love. This is Chris Jenkins from Villanova. Chris Jenkins hit literally a last second three pointer in 2016 to win the national championship for Villanova over North Carolina. This is him in that shot about to release the ball. What you don't see here is a split second after he releases the ball, the backboard goes red to, to, to alert the crowd that the, the clock is done, but the ball's already in the air. It was a three point shot. He made it. And that's our logo there on the stanchion at the bottom. Oh, the nice. So just sort of those brushes of greatness are the things that really just kind of um, excite me and what really, what again, the reason I get out of bed every morning. So that's a little bit about me and how I use typography. Uh, hopefully that was um, informative for uh, some of you guys, but if there's questions or anything, um, I'm, pretty much a, I'm pretty much an open book. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of open book, we do have some questions in, but I just want to say thank you so much, Joe. That was awesome. Um, sure. I mean, we love your work. Uh, Michael yeah. had pointed out, my partner, Michael, had pointed out your work to me when he was doing some uh, logo work for his uh, daughter's color guard team. So use your, nice. your work as inspiration. Well, that's, that sounds like a project we might be interested in, Rachel. Oh, okay. so, uh, you know. <laughs> I don't know how much high schools have in their, their budgets, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go through the questions, if that's yeah. okay. All right. Sure, sure. Um, so Tracy has a question. She starts with OMG. Uh, Working in sports would be my dream job. How did you get started, and how do I break into this field? Yeah, well, you know, my story is kind of I, – I, I think I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. You know, I really do, uh, because I didn't when I graduated from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia in 1994, I didn't know that design and sports was a thing. I didn't know that you could make a career out of it. I was a sports fan. There was no doubt about that. But I was when I graduated, I was just looking for a job. I wasn't looking for my quote unquote dream job. And I went to a art directors club in New York luncheon. They used to do these things every year in the springtime, and they would invite graduating seniors in from all over the country. They had art directors, um, well, I guess not all over the country, all over the East Coast. And they would invite these art directors in to review your portfolio. And they weren't there to give you a job. They were just there to um, give you advice, you know, look at your portfolio. And you, you know how those things are. I mean, there's portfolio reviews. And they're great. They're great. But I ended up meeting David Haney at that, that portfolio review. 
At the time, David Haney was the director of creative services at the National Hockey League. And um, through a series of phone calls and interviews, he offered me my first job. And it was really my first taste of, of working in sports as a creative. Mm -hmm. So that's how I broke into it. Now, how do, you, how do you break into it? It's not easy. It's not easy because there are, there are so many people that are interested in it. It's kind of a, you know, attractive career path that it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. You just got to do it. You know, you just got to keep, keep uh, working on your skills and portfolio and do it. Great. Thank you, Tracy, for asking. So I have a, a, just a quick couple things. I always tell my students to be careful about their very first job that they get out of college because uh -huh. it sometimes will direct your career for the whole, you know, your whole career. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. so you got to choose yeah. wisely, right? And also just yeah. keep networking. Go to these portfolio re reviews. You never know who you're going to meet. So it does make absolutely difference. Absolutely. Rachel, I have a good friend of mine, Fraser Davidson. Fraser is an animator in London. And Fraser is just loves American sports. And uh -huh. he, he has, um, he, he's always wanted to do this kind of stuff. So he did it. He just went out and did it. He started developing identity, made up teams, made up projects, put it on the internet. And it's kind of like hitting 40 home runs in the minor leagues. You're going to get noticed. And he got noticed. And now Fraser does identity for the graphic identity group at Nike Team Sports. So Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's also mm -hmm. a good idea is to self-commission your own work. Just just show some passion and it will happen. That's right. So just a couple of things. So my partner, Michael, said that there's no budget in the high school. So you'll see them. <laughs> so unfortunately, <laughs> sorry about that, Joe. Michael, and Michael, I'm a sucker for youth sports. I'm a sucker for youth sports. <laughs> So he uh, also put in a link there if you'd like to take a look I at the color guard that he did. Yeah. And then Abby, she is a professor at Tyler School of Arts. So she's got yeah. a little shout out for you. Um, cool. We're just going to keep going because we've got tons of questions piling in. And yeah. we're going yeah. try to try to end the top of the hour, but I don't know. So mm -hmm. Nick is asking if someone was a not too much younger version of you and working in the sports branding and design world, any notes on cracking into bigger clients and planting your yeah. your flag in the ground for growth. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's, there, there was lots of opportunity in sports as a designer. A lot of that opportunity comes in the minor leagues. It comes in, um, you know, places that are perhaps a little less higher profile. Not every project is the, the you know, New York Giants, right? Um, but so those, those bigger projects are really few and far between. And if you think about how many of those happen every single year, it's really not, it's really not, not that many. So those are really ones that are really hard. They're, they're really hard to, hard to break into those things. You have to sort of have a track record and you have to kind of have them almost, you know, almost fi find you, you know, uh, the bigger projects tend to be requests for proposals. So uh, we are on that list of the usual suspects. So when you shake the tree, all the usual suspects fall out. Um, so we usually get those get those proposals, but but we don't win them all, you know. We don't, and frankly, we don't go after them. There are some that are good fits, and there are some that are not. And um, you know, we've we've passed on some of the biggest sports identity projects in the world, but they were just toxic. You just couldn't touch them. So, um, but but the ones that we do go after, we really try to go after hardcore. But the bigger ones, they they become more of a challenge. I don't know if there's a necessarily and that's a horrible answer. Because I don't really know if there's any formula for success in, in finding those. Okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> I hope that helped, Nick. Yeah. All right. So Megan's asking, do you think it's more challenging to create a logo slash branding from scratch or to rebrand slash update a current logo or branding? Oh, I think it's far more difficult to update, to, to sort of re, rebrand an existing team. When you, when you have uh, a team that's new, um, or even a nickname that's new. The idea that the, the developing something that doesn't have uh, affinity or doesn't have affection from uh, from a, a long track record or a long history that's that's far that's far easier. We, we are we are as human beings we are um, we're adverse to change. You know, most of us. Um, a lot of us just like things to sort of stay the way they are. So that's not good news for me because I happen to be in the change business. So when we come to campus or we go to a client or a team, 
we're going to change things for them. Mm -hmm. So change is always much harder than starting from scratch, like an expansion team, for example, or uh, the NCAA a number of years ago came out and uh, banned uh, offensive nicknames. So you couldn't have uh, Native American themed nicknames in the NCAA. So those are a lot lower hurdles because there's, there's, you can't stay still. You have to move on. Okay, great. Yeah, and I'm sure that the you get some reaction from the fans too when that changes. <laughs> All the time. I mean, it's, you know, I, I understand it. I get it. But uh, a lot of times it's unwarranted. You know, we're just, we're doing our jobs, you know. Right. And, uh, but the, the, the hate mail that I get is, um, it, it, in a word, majestic. It's just oh. unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. It's, it's I, hey, listen. I'm very, very thick skin, Rachel. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Phil is asking, "Hey, Joe, within the scope of these projects, what is typically the pattern of workflow? Does the primary mark influence the custom typeface, or is it more of a cohesive exercise?" Um, the primary mark, no doubt, influences the typography. Always, it's always the case especially with the work that we're doing now where a lot of it is more letter based. I mean, the, the marks that we do in primary logos are not necessarily as mascot driven as they are um, typography driven. And that's really, again, it's sort of part of the, of the trend of things and it's part of where, where we're going right now. But they're always, th those always are the, in my opinion, I think they're the more challenging ones to get right. And then those are the ones that then influence the subsequent typography that shows up in all of those applications. There isn't one that is more important than the other because I think they both play critical roles in successful athletic identity, but, uh, but definitely uh, that, that primary icon comes first. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rachel is asking, when you are designing a branding system for a team or school, how many surfaces do you test the logos on to determine if they are successful? Can you tell us more about your logo process? Um, well, when you talk about like surfaces, testing them on surfaces, uh, we always do uh, actual world testing in, in a lot of the work that we do because these things need to be visible from a distance and they need to work in certain very key applications. So for example, we'll send everything out to have it embroidery tested before we finalize anything. Because if it doesn't work in embroidery, we're going to exclude probably uh, more than half of the applications in which licensed logos show up. So we'll take a look, at, we'll have it stitched out in embroidery if there's issues with the mark. And we'll actually work with the digitizer as well. If there's certain areas of the mark that needs to be finessed or changed, We'll go in and we'll we'll make some of those tweaks and updates before it actually hits the hits the world, but also in uniform application too. You know that's been something that we've done forever. Um, I still remember and as a young designer at the NHL, we were working on the Phoenix Coyotes logo when the Coyotes moved when the when they got a hockey team and this was ninety five or ninety six. And I remember like printing out the logo on my you know, Xerox phaser thermal printer and safety pinning it to a blank white jersey and going to Madison Square Garden. There was a Rangers game that night. The lights were up. The, all the key TV cameras were up for the MSG network. And we had one employee in the NHL who could skate reasonably well, skate around the ice with this logo pinned to his chest to make sure that uh, on television, it's going to be, it's going to work. Yep, you got to do that. You gotta oh, do yeah. That. I always get mad at uh, people who are designing menus for restaurants and, or bar menus, and it's totally dark. They didn't test the typography in it. So it's like, you got to test exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. And you think about that, how they're, that's how they're going to be up. They're going to be viewed most of the time, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And if not, I'll call them out with a type crime and take a photo and tweet it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so Andy is asking, I saw the book Boise State Branding in your portfolio. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. So I have a fan question. Was the red-eyed Bronco at all inspired by Luis Jimenez sculpture, Blue Mustang, that stands outside of the Denver International Airport? It was not. No. <laughs> okay. it's, a, it's actually, it's an orange eye because Boise State's uh, colors are royal blue and orange. Uh, but no, it was not, it was not inspired by that. It was just use of color. 
Um, again, we talked about sort of limited color palettes being available to sports designers. It was just a way to be able to bring in some of the some of the color palette into into that logo. But hey, here's a here's a here's a little fan tidbit for you on the Boise State logo. A lot of people don't know this. There's two variants of the primary logo: the Bronco head over the top of Boise State. There's two variants. There's one that is um, one where it faces left and one where it faces right. So, and the idea for that was, if you'll indulge me for yeah, a minute. go get it. The idea for that was that on the, on on both sides of the helmet, the Bronco always faces forward. So I, I was I was in a bar once in Boise, Idaho. This is a true story, and I was telling a fan this, and they said that's not true. There's only one version of the logo. I've, I've been a fan forever, and I said the logo on your hat is different than the logo on your. You had a polo shirt on, different than the logo on your polo shirt, and there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you must win a lot of bar bets, huh? <laughs> not really. Not really. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, thank you, Andy. So Abby is asking, what is what's your dream project? Oh, well, it's easy. That's easy. The Super Bowl. You know, I mean, the Super Bowl <laughs> is the, I think every um, sports designer's dream is the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And um, I have some friends of mine, Todd Radom and Dan Simon, both extremely talented uh, sports designers, both of them. And they've both done Super Bowl logos. And I'm jealous. So I'm, I'm, I, hope, I hope that someday there might be a, a, a opportunity, who knows? Right. So dream for sports designers and dream for athletes as well. Yeah, right, yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Exactly, yeah. the Super yeah. Bowl, yeah. yeah. So Mike, Michael is asking, how often do you develop a new typeface for a school slash client? Yeah, it's becoming more and more common now. And I think it's really, like I said uh, during the presentation, I think it's really a product of the time because there's so much content that's getting generated by teams um, in social media that having that custom font really does help you be able to tie all those communications together and still be able to communicate, but tie all of those communications together in a way that they all feel like they're coming from the same place. Mm -hmm. Wow, who knew that there was that's going to be an important skill set for designers outside of the oh. millions of other things that we're doing? Oh. I know. Yeah. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. You know, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's sort of like, um, they're, they're logical extensions to the work that we do specifically when it comes to the word marks to be able to extrapolate it out. I don't like to do uh, fonts that are directly related to the word marks. I like them to have some unique components so that the word mark that shows up on the Jersey still feels special. Right. That makes sense. Okay, thank you, Michael, for asking yeah. asking the question. Um, okay, so we, how are you on time? We've got two more questions so far, yeah. and uh, yeah, a minute. You okay? All right. Of course, yeah, absolutely. I got all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh well, yeah. we'll hang out all day then. <laughs> hey, Darren. Oh, Darren's asking this question. You talked about the trademark ability of marks and typography. What's your process for crafting unique, ownable typography? How much is modified versus, or how, how much is modified from existing fonts versus created from scratch? Because yeah, you know, I think that I, I don't, I don't like to really modify existing fonts. I think that I take lots of inspiration from other fonts, but I don't, I don't like just sort of taking fonts and um, creating outline and just kind of modifying things here and there. I try to be um, a little bit more original than that. Sometimes that's easier to do than others. Certain times clients may have an existing font that they already use throughout certain aspects of, of their brand. Maybe it's on the institutional side of things and they would like to have a font that is relevant to or referenced by uh, one, of those, one of those fonts. But when it comes to things from scratch, I try, I try to do things that are a little bit more um, original. It's not as easy. Um, because there's, especially when it comes to the, the follow through, the the kerning pairs and the and building out all of the you know all of those sorts of things, but um, but I just think it contributes to the ownability of it. Thank you so much for asking, Darren. Drew is asking when you enter the discovery phase of a branding project with a school team or event. How much time do you spend on location for research and data collection? Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, I, I would say I'd say my initial reaction is a lot, but it's usually not more than than a couple of days. But they're real immersive days where we really get into the sort of the archives, understand 
their not understand their current visuals through a complete brand audit, but also understand their historic visuals and where they came from. Um, I really get a sense and feel for the fabric of the place, and you can't do that without getting on the ground and walking around campus. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to go on an admissions tour. Um, I don't when we when we go on admissions tours. Uh, it's usually unannounced, so we'll just we'll schedule a tour, and then you know these these two old guys show up and get in the golf cart and go around the the admissions tour, and you know a lot of and inevitably the question is, oh, are you looking at this pool for your um, for your children? And it's <laughs> like, no, no, we're here for us. And um, but you but what that gives you is it really does give you that authentic perspective of what this school was like. And if I, if I, when we get to campus, we don't know what we don't know, right? Yeah. And yeah. these tour guides are their job and they're trained to tell people about this school. So I, that's, that's what I, I love. I love going through that. We always learn a ton of things and you inevitably find those, um, those nuggets that become the, the, the inspiration for some sort of concept. And that's really what we're doing in the discovery phase. We're prospecting, you know, we're looking for those nuggets and we're just listening and just soaking, soaking everything up. So, but yeah, it's, it's, I would say that we spend, it, it's not in terms of hours. We're not like, we're not there for like weeks at a time, but a couple of days, but those are truly like immersive, immersive days. And then we're also talking to stakeholders too. We're interviewing large groups of people. We're really getting their um, sense of, they got to tell us who they are. You know, we can't tell them. Right, right, right. No, that's a that's a great answer. Actually, now that I think about it, I wish all our corporate branding clients had admission tours because yeah, a lot of times they can't always tell us about yeah. who they are. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's great. right. You know, it's I guess in some industries, right? You probably could. You know, at like the Yingling Brewery down the street, they have like tours. They could probably tell you all about it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> all right. So one more question. Um, I love this because we started out with like three questions and as we kept going, they kept asking questions. Oh, so thank you so much for everyone asking. Joshua was asking, when you create a custom typeface, does it ever lead to the university as a whole adopting it? Or is it usually yeah. just restricted to athletics? You know, uh, the the uh, when he says typeface, I'm assuming he's talking about the font itself. Oh, um, uh, and and I, I I can't I don't know if I've ever really had an instance where the font was necessarily adopted. But one of the things that we're seeing more and more of is we are seeing some of the icons and some of the type driven directions that we create being adopted. And the reason being is because a lot of schools, the impression of their identity is. Um, is there the, the impression there's far more there's far more impressions of athletic identity out there than there is institutional identity so if you think about a school like mississippi yeah. state for example their logo is seen on national television probably a half a dozen times a year football games broadcast football games uh their logo shows up on licensed merchandise far more than any institutional logo it definitely shows up on social media with their 20 plus athletic teams far more than the institutional logo so the impressions are far more on the athletic side and what's happened in, in recent years has been that universities have seen this and they have started to adopt athletic logos as institutional logos so Mississippi State is one of those. They've adopted the athletic logo that we created as an institutional mark. So you see that now for the whole institution. Um, the, you can think of schools like Michigan, um, schools like the University of Miami. They've adopted athletic logos as their institutional logos because the equity is just huge in them. You know, the equity in those marks. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I was I was wondering the same thing that Abby asked. Do they pay you more if they adopt it? Uh, you know, I never tried that actually. Oh, um, Joe. <laughs> um, you no, know, we should probably we should probably go back and revisit some of those contracts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, 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 re, the short answer is, and the reality is that our work is fee for service. So we we perform a service; they pay us a fee. All rights in perpetuity are transferred over to the client through an assignment of rights, and they own it. They own it exclusively. Okay. If I could have, uh, Rachel, if I could have kept like, you know, 0.01% of royalty of every logo yeah. that we've ever done here, I mean, I, I would have retired 10 years ago. You know, it's just, yeah. 
that they're just not written that way. Right. That makes sense. I mean, you are developing identity. Once you hand it over, it's theirs. You don't, you're not charging that's for right. these. That's that right. But that's, I mean, I think there's, there's a lesson in that though for designers and that is to, you know, char charge a fair rate. You know, these are, these are icons that generate you know, sport, sports licensing alone is a billion dollar industry. So these are icons that generate serious revenue for the teams and the institutions that they represent. So there, there's, there's value. There's value there. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That was great. I love. Yeah, cool. I mean, awesome, awesome, awesome. It was. It was an inspiring session. And Diane Gibbs just jumped in, and and she says hi to you. And it's great uh, to see everybody here. She's awesome. Thanks, Eric. She's awesome. Yeah, I love. Her. Cool. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much again for for sharing this information. So, if people want to be watching what you're doing. Do they keep an eye on the website, or how else? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the website is like. Well, you know how this is, right? I mean, the website totally. is totally woefully outdated um and uh you know i don't i don't really keep up with much there but on the socials certainly keep up i'm uh, my personal twitter is at j bosack um joe bosack co is the corporate version of our, our twitter account i think it's the same on i think j bosack on instagram um so yeah i'm not that hard to find <laughs> awesome well thank cool. you again so guys well, reach you. out to joe if you want to watch what he's doing his work is definitely inspirational um and again thank you so much for the time so guys thanks for hanging out with us and um i love the fact that uh you know we got to talk about sports which we never do much sports and typography such a small niche but yeah you've brought yeah. so much light to it so thank you joe well thank you thank you rachel thank you to everyone that that sort of tuned in this has been a lot of fun and uh yeah it's uh cool great all right all right see you guys next time all right bye, have a good everyone. day okay, okay. bye, -bye.